29 years. That's how long it took Sports Authority to dominate and become a household name in the sports retail industry, but also disappear overnight like it never existed. The clock has run out for Sports Authority. The sporting goods retailer plans to begin going out of business sales as soon as this Friday and will close all 463 stores by the end of August. Saying Sports Authority probably had one of the shortest lifespans in the retail industry would not be an exaggeration. In a short span, it was able to get to the heights of success some businesses only dream of, but it also came down with just as much ferocity. Sports Authority, one of the largest sporting good retailers, shutting its doors, impacting hundreds of workers across the Bay Area. From operating 463 stores in 45 states and Puerto Rico at their peak to declaring bankruptcy in 2016, Sports Authority has seen it all. Many factors have played a role in its downfall, from its bad management to its unwillingness to change with time. Today, its rise and downfall have become a cautionary tale as to what not to do while operating a business. Whether you are an entrepreneur or a business enthusiast, you can learn something from Sports Authority. But the question is, do you remember Sports Authority? If you remember anything about it, you might feel like they magically disappeared overnight. So, the year is 1987, and mega stores are what's trending. What comes to your mind when you think of a toy store? Toys are us, right? The goal was to do the same thing with sports-related items. In 1987, Jack Smith, who was the COO of another sports retail, Herman's World of Sporting Goods, along with other investors, started Sports Authority. Their goal was to run the megastore to make it a one-stop shop for everything sports-related. Smith already had experience running a sports store, so running this one did not seem like a big deal. The first store was open in Lakes Mall in Lauderdale Lakes, Florida in 1987. They got quick success and were already being noticed by sports enthusiasts in Florida who flooded into their stores. They opened around eight more stores in the span of three years. As their home base was Florida, those eight new stores were mostly around there. So what were they doing right? Unlike other stores, they had put huge emphasis on the customer's experience in the stores. Sports is not something everyone has knowledge or interest in, which means without proper knowledge, employees cannot cater to the needs of their customers. Smith knew this with his previous experiences and focused on delivering the best customer service. They focused highly on hiring sports enthusiasts as their employees and also training them. Besides this, the management hugely focused on keeping the prices low. Along with low prices and great customer service, another thing the company was doing right was the product variations. They had almost 50,000 product items in their stores, but this tactic of keeping their costs low turned out to be costly for the company. Turns out the company was not making much of a profit at all. So you might wonder what their strategy was. The thing the company was trying to achieve was economies of scale. To keep the prices on the lower side to beat the competitors, they needed their costs to be low too. And how could that be achieved? Through economies of scale. This was the reason why they were trying aggressively to expand. After opening a few stores, they had exhausted their resources. Sports Authority needed someone with huge resources to step in to expand it further. That's where Kmart comes in. In 1990, Kmart was the US's biggest retailer. This is just what Sports Authority needed. The chairman of Kmart, Joseph Antonina, believed in Jack Smith's plan and acquired the company for $75 million in March of 1990. If their expansion tactics were aggressive before, it was no match to what Kmart was bringing to the table. Kmart amplified the company's already aggressive marketing and extension, and in just five years, they opened 100 stores. Under Kmart, the revenue grew, and it also became profitable for the first time. Soon, they became somewhat independent from Kmart as they were able to make a name for themselves. Their balance sheet proved that as well because they were making huge profits, but soon the company was about to experience some serious turmoil. The 90s were not a good time for Kmart. They were dethroned as the number one retailer in the country. Their core business was struggling, and they had lost nearly $1 billion. To keep their core business afloat, Kmart decided to spin off some businesses it acquired. It included Sports Authority along with other businesses. So in 1994, Sports Authority went public. 71% of the company was offered to the public, which raised $270 million. 1994 was also the year of overseas expansion for Sports Authority. It opened stores in Canada and Japan. This was also the year Nike decided to sell to the company. Sports Authority was thriving and it showed no signs of stopping. In 1995, it became the first sports retailer to exceed $1 billion in sales. The company went through a series of ups and downs from here. The company saw its net profit as well as its sales fall. In 1996, it took debt for the first time since they came into operation. Jack Smith was replaced by someone else as the CEO. Their initial strategy of expansion became a burden as some stores were not performing well and shutting down stores started to become common. 
Along with this, their customers started to feel disengaged. Many felt like the employees were always busy stacking shelves instead of providing customer service. And since the company was cutting employees, they started to worsen. They listened to their customers and tried to improve because who would want to shop at a place where there was such bad customer service, right? Especially when there were a lot of other alternatives. In 2003, Sports Authority again saw a change in ownership. They merged with Gart Sports Company. It was Gart who bought the company, but they decided to keep the name of the company Sports Authority. With this merger, Sports Authority now had more than 300 stores nationwide. In just three years after this, the company was bought by a private equity, Leonard Green, for $1.3 billion. After this, Sports Authority became a private company, and it was under this private equity they filed for bankruptcy. In 2011, the stadium in which the Broncos played was named Sports Authority. With a mountain of debt of over $1 billion, the company declared bankruptcy in 2016. Their initial goal was to downsize the company and sell to someone, but that didn't work out. Dick's Sporting Goods acquired the rights to the company for $15 million in an auction. This was the end of Sports Authority. Dick's have not yet used anything related to Sports Authority, nor have they started it back up again. For now, there is no Sports Authority. So now let's talk about what went wrong with Sports Authority and why it went out of business. One of the major things that can be blamed is unstable management. As you can see in its short lifespan, the ownership was changed over five times. These kinds of frequent changes bring instability to an organization. Along with this, their strategy of expansion backfired. They created a situation of oversaturation in the market. Having a lot of stores so it's accessible to the customer is great, but stores 300 yards from each other is not a good idea, no matter how successful the business is, that were not performing well, and instead of reducing the cost, they increased it. With the rise of Amazon, the competition was increasing. The management at Sports Authority was not very keen on changing their ways. This played a huge role in their downfall. No matter how successful a business is, it needs to adapt with time. There was the rise of e-commerce and every business was adapting to it, but not Sports Authority. They lacked innovation. They had started using e-commerce platforms, but still kept their focus on expanding physical stores while the customers were focusing on going online. Because of this, they lost a large part of their market share to their competitors. Of course, their sales were down by huge numbers, so there was no way they could pay off the massive amount of debt they had accumulated over the years to expand the business. Sports Authority also failed to meet the changing needs of customers. The popularity of athleisure grew. They were casual wear inspired by workout clothes. So basically, people started wearing workout-inspired clothes as everyday wear, and where did they seek these clothes? In sports retail. Other companies were quick to realize this and started offering a range of athleisure wares, but Sports Authority fell behind on this as well. They did not have much of an online presence and also failed to capitalize on ongoing trends in the market. This is sure to impact the business. In 2015, the company lost an estimated $256 million. Maybe it was because of bad management or unwillingness to adapt and change, but Sports Authority also failed to appeal to various local markets. It started in the sunny state of Florida, but expanded nationwide. From the looks of it, the retailer was very slow in adapting to the local markets. They operated in diverse locations, so one-shoe-fits-all tactics hardly work. What the customers of the West want is very different from what the customers of the East want. Their selection was the same all around the company, which means the customers of the specific locations were not being catered to, which meant more opportunities for the competitors to grab the customers. Along with this, customers were also fed up with their bad management and bad customer service. The customers felt like they were way out of date, way before they filed for bankruptcy. They did not update their inventories in time, nor were there any new trending products. People felt that Dix, who was their major competitor, was way ahead of Sports Authority in terms of items as well as management. The company was in a lot of financial trouble and had been for years. Maybe the management felt like the downfall of the company was inevitable, so no effort was put in to revive the company. The company was bearing a loss and was also falling behind on interest payments. This kind of situation never turns out good for the company. No one saw any potential for the company and was unwilling to buy it to save it from its ultimate downfall. It ultimately had to file for bankruptcy. One of the largest sports retailers in the country, Sports Authority's fall from grace has been full of ups and downs. Its unwillingness to change and adapt to the changing needs of the market has been the reason for its ultimate demise. It also proves that aggressive expansion is not the only way for retail to be successful. The fall of Sports Authority, again, proves that if a business is not able to appeal to the changing needs of customers, no matter how successful the business is, its downfall is inevitable. What do you think of the downfall of Sports Authority? Tell us in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Thanks for watching. See you next time.